Jack, let's get into the flavor of the month, uh, which is a very important flavor, uh, an enduring flavor that sometimes gets lost from time to time. A couple of years ago, you conceived of and edited a book uh, uh, that was included chapters by uh, prominent chief executive officers on the subject of integrity, uh, corporate character, whatever you want to call it. And I, I don't want you to get out of here without talking a little bit about wh what did you what did you learn from uh, those chapters submitted by CEOs, uh, or what had you hoped to learn and didn't? Either way, you want to look at the question. Uh, how do how do you institutionalize integrity? How do you insinuate that into a into a large organization? Well, there. <clears throat> several answers to that question. And the first thing I'd like to say is that Building Trust was written as a project of the Page Society, yes. and it was done really as a response to the uh, headlines uh, denoting week after week or month after month uh, corporate uh, corruption, dishonesty, and uh, uh, really uh, acts of, uh, of real criminal negligence in, in, in several several cases. And uh, in a speech that Jeffrey Garten, who was that time the dean of Yale, made that he said all that America needs or business needs is for uh, a dozen CEOs to speak up about what they're doing in their businesses and that will begin to quiet the furor of uh, and feeling that all American business is uh, dishonest and crooked. So, <laughs> right. so uh, the Page Society took that to heart and felt that there's one of the things that we were very much for because uh, the very first principle in the Page Society, which Arthur Page articulated, was tell the truth. And we uh, believe that wholeheartedly. We subscribe to it, and all of our members uh, did that. So it became uh, apparent that this was something that we could uh, that we could do, and that maybe we could help the reputation of American business by taking on this activity. So consequently, uh, because I was at that time in a retired state, though my wife wouldn't necessarily agree with that, I agreed to take on the responsibility of uh, trying to put that book together. It was uh, uh, done with the help of, of course, Dave Drobus, who was then the president of, uh, of the Page Society, and Ron Culp, and many others really contributed to uh, helping to make, 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 it, make it happen. Uh, one of the things that became clear to me, and in, in we, as it turned out, we wound up with essays from uh, 23 CEOs that were included in the book. Actually, my idea was to have 24, which would be two dozen, which was twice what <laughs> Jeffrey Garten had said. But uh, uh, incredibly, at the very last minute, as we were going on the press, one of the best essays and one of the best by one of the CEOs that I happen to personally like the best, called me up and said that I'm, our company is going, he, he was a major shareholder in the company, he said our company is going through an enormously difficult time here and we're going to reorganize and I'm not sure how I'm, where I'm going to be when the reorganization is all over. And so he said, I, I, I just don't think that it would be in your best interest to have me in a book that's coming out in six months or a year from now because <clears throat> I'm not sure what my fate is going to be. And so I learned that, that this was typical of him up front, integrity, honest, you know, here's an alert. Uh, not every CEO would have done that. Some CEOs would have tried to fly under cover and because they were felt that you know, they wanted to be part of this mixed group of uh, outstanding CEOs. Uh, I think that the thing that I learned that there's no question that in a major corporation, and even a minor corporation, if there is such a thing, that the CEO sets the tone. If the CEO's behavior is uh, above board, uh, there's a good chance that that will filter down through the organization. It isn't going to happen 
uh, automatically, but if, the, if there's any question about the behavior of the CEO, uh, the employees are going to look at this with a jaundice eye. I think one of the best examples is what happened with, with Boeing and Harry Stonecipher, who was an absolutely terrific CEO, but got caught up in a couple of uh, situations which uh, <coughs> were not uh, in the best interest of the Boeing, Boeing company, and he uh, was forced to resign, which he did. His replacement at the first meeting that uh, they had of the senior management team after that uh, meeting, uh, uh, called them all together, and the chief uh, lawyer put up on the screen photos of the two, actually there were two deposed uh, senior people at, at uh, Boeing, had their headshots on there, and under the headshots were uh, were a whole row of numbers. And the uh, the uh, chief uh, general counsel said, "You all know know that those are not social security <laughs> 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 numbers. They're under that." And with that, McNerney, who was the CEO, was the new CEO, said, and he said, "That is precisely what will happen to anyone who violates our." Uh, code of conduct and uh, expectations for truthful behavior. He said, I want that to be understood right now, and you're hearing it from me. And that was a vivid uh, illustration. Several of, I have several friends who work for Boeing, and they told me if there was ever a message delivered, that was, uh, that was really well done. Well, in, in other, other companies, uh, it was clear, like in the Eaton, Eaton Company, with uh, Cutler, uh, he uh, right after he took over the job, that he was confronted with uh, with uh, one of his uh, officers in uh, Asia, the head of their actually Asian operation, who was awarding contracts to a firm that his wife was involved with, without putting him out for bids. When he learned that. He was this. He was the best operating guy he had in the whole company. Bomb. He was fired. He then uh, explained to uh, the employees of the Eaton Corporation that uh, this is not a three strikes you're out company. He said one strike and you're out. Those kind of messages resonate through uh, through the corporations. Other corporations, and uh, Bill Walden from J and J is a good example, have a long history of having a, a code of ethics or a code of conduct that they go over annually with all of their employees to make sure they understand. So there's a long history of, of that sort of uh, thing, <coughs> and consequently, uh, it's it, it, you kind of expect them to have this, and you learn that there is value in having a code of conduct or a set of basic principles. But uh, the thing is, and, uh, and I, would, I, ha I think that you uh, agree with this, is that you can have all the code of conducts that you want in your corporation, but when it gets right down to it, it's the individual who makes the difference. If the individual is raised in an environment where they're taught the difference between right and wrong, that's likely to carry over throughout their lives, and they'll have that understanding. And no f uh, form of persuasion, one way or the other, will cause them to do other. There are other borderline cases that can be persuaded one way or the other, but basically having a code of conduct is they know that they're violating it, but that doesn't necessarily prevent them from doing it if they see in our culture today that somehow or other it's in their personal best interests. And that, I think that's one of the things that I learned that, again, this whole sense of greed and the me now generation, that you can have all the teachings, whether they're from the Bible or the Koran or whatever, about proper behavior. But uh, in, in our culture today, those can be easily ignored if there are people who uh, feel that they can gain somehow personally from this. A person like Marilyn Carlson, at the Car who headed up the Carlson companies, uh, said something that uh, struck me as being in the uh, book. In, in, in the book, that was uh, really uh, significant. She says that 
this uh, is a basically a family company and she's yeah. the generation that's running it now. She said that if we wa expect and want our employees to keep this company alive and preserve it for a long, we have to treat them like we're running this business for a long, long term. We have to re respect their rights, their individual rights and, and, and what their needs are. And if we can do that, then they will help us perpetuate this company. If we don't, uh, in a generation or two, she said, this, we won't be able to keep this company. Well, uh,